Greetings friends, welcome to Sovereign Grace Doctrine. We thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to watch our videos. I pray that our history studies and doctrinal studies will be a blessing unto all of those of you who are following along. We continue here in this 13th century looking at the errors that the councils of the Roman Catholic Church entered and brought into existence. And we continue here to look at this here ideal of confession. This false sacrament, this false teaching that they began to teach that after one was saved and baptized, they were teaching that all the sins that were committed prior to that point were covered under the blood. And now began to teach that from that point of baptism, that point of faith and salvation, everything going forward had to be confessed, had to be acknowledged to a priest that he could then go and present it before God and pray for your absolution, pray for your forgiveness. My friends, we have forgiveness in Jesus Christ for all that we've done. When we acknowledge Him, when we are saved, He saved us from all of our sins. Not just what we have committed from that point back, but from that point back and everything forward in our life, everything was paid for on the cross of Calvary. Uh, and my friends, if there was one sin, just one sin, that was not paid for there on the cross of Calvary, then you can't be saved. Oh, it amazes me how there are those who want him, uh, they want to say, well, Christ died for all the world. And he died to redeem all of you, but yet they hold this fear over you that there's this one little sin that God didn't pay for, that Christ didn't pay for there on that cross of Calvary. And they would see that's that sin of unbelief. Well, friends, that's heresy. He either paid for it all or he didn't pay for any of it. Oh, but they want to make God a debtor to all mankind. So, oh, yeah, he bought us all. If he bought everybody, then he's paid for it all. But let me ask you this, you Armenians. How many times did you hear the gospel preached before you believed? Did you believe it the first time you heard it? Did you receive it the first time you heard it? Well, every time you didn't receive it, every time you didn't believe it, you were guilty of unbelief. And you should be on your way to hell then if he didn't pay for the sin of unbelief. But all today you're saved. It's all but uh, if you stay in unbelief. No. You can't have it both ways. Either he paid for unbelief or he didn't. And the fact is, there's not a one of us that believed the gospel the first time we heard it. Or would be very few of us that believed it the first time. Tell me, did Saul believe it the first time he heard it? Talking about that one in the New Testament, Saul. No, he didn't, did he? He didn't believe the first time he heard it. He persecuted many, and I'm sure they all bore witness for him. They were preaching Jesus for him. He did not believe it the first time he heard it. But he continued on down his merry road as a religious man, persecuting the Christians, persecuting those that were not following the Jewish authority. Just as you today, you want to persecute everyone that disagrees with you because they're not following you and believing everything word for word for word that you believe. Ye hypocrites, ye are as guilty of unbelief as any other. And you ought to be on the way to hell, but you're not, if you believe the gospel. Anyone that's believed the gospel is truly saved. And if you're truly saved, you can grow in the grace and knowledge of the Word of God and understand all these things if you'll but humble yourself. Humble yourself before God and acknowledge Him in all your ways. Say, Lord, teach me. Holy Spirit of God, give me understanding. For it is that Holy Spirit of God that gives us understanding and, and reveals these things unto us. Now, this here ocular confession, this here penance, this sacrament that they introduced and it being a thing that they could keep over the people of fear. Oh, you've gone and you've sinned in your daily life, and you ought to at least come in once a year. You can do it every week if you want to. Come on in here and tell us all the dirty deeds. Tell us all the dirty details. 
that we might be able then to go back in the back room and think about ourselves. All oh, such wickedness is rolled in here and such wickedness that they allow to exist. Teaching things that are contrary to the Word of God. Now, we looked there last time in the Old Testament what it had to say about confession. Now we look to the New Testament to see what it says about confession. We look first in Matthew chapter 10 and starting at verse 26 where Christ tells us to confess or to confess before him or to confess me before men. Uh, chapter 10 verse 26 says, Fear them not therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness that speak ye in light, and what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetop. In other words, there is nothing that God reveals unto us that we're to keep to ourselves and how we're to declare it openly. Preach the whole counsel of God to this lost and dying world. Preach the whole counsel of God to his churches. He goes on to say, And fear not them which kill the body, and are not able to kill the soul but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Who can do that? Who's going to, who's going to cast you into hell? Is Satan the one going to drag you down to hell? No, it's the devil's hell, is it not? Made for the devil and his angels that fail. But also all those who die in unbelief are going to be sent there by God. But hell is just a waiting place. It's not purgatory, my friends. There is no such place. There is heaven above, there is this earth, and then there is hell beneath, and there is no other place that you can be. And those that are waiting in the hell, they are like waiting in the jail cell for their arraignment, for their final judgment. And there's no pardon coming for them. There's no redemption coming for them. They're already there in chains, bound in darkness, until the time comes that they're going to be called to stand before the judge at that white throne judgment, and then they shall be judged and found wanting and cast into the lake of fire. But every soul, it is God who can destroy the body and the soul. He says, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. Now he's talking about that all knowledge, that all present knowledge, that, all pre that the, uh, omnipotence of God where he knows and understands all that's happening. Even though these birds out here, if one of them falls on the ground and dies, God knows it. He knows everything that's going on in this world. A tree falls in the forest. God knows it, even though there's no one else there. But the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Think about that. I find I have fewer and fewer of them in these days of my life now. But still yet God has numbered the hairs on my head and he has yours too. It says, Fear ye not therefore, ye are more ye are of more value than many sparrows. Brethren, Friends, do we not understand this? God says to each of us as a human being that we're more valuable to him than all these birds out here flying around. And he provides for them, does he not? He goes on to say, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. My friends, he's not just talking about when you're first saved. When you're first saved and you come before an assembly, assembly of believers, a church, and you come before them and acknowledge you're a, sin, you're a sinner and that you believe the gospel and that you have come forward in repentance and faith and you want to be baptized, you want to follow the Lord in baptism, and that's what you ought to do if you're a newborn babe in Christ. You should first follow the Lord in baptism for that's what the church is to do. That's what the Great Commission tells us to do. We are to preach the gospel of this lost and dying world and those that receive it with gladness in their hearts that come forward in repentance and faith and it is a turning. 
It is a turning from your old ways, the old sinful life wherein you've lived. It's a turning from that to God. And my friends, that is in the Bible. You'll find it in the Gospel of John. He says we're to repent and turn to God. He says, I will confess you before my fathers and have you confess me before me. Now, my friends, it's not just that. It's not just that first time when you come forward. It's the liberty which you find now in your heart. You've been forgiven of your sins and the joy and the hope that's been given unto you. And now you want to tell people about it. You're saved. I've been saved and I want you to know I want you to know that the burden that you have upon you, that there is one who says he'll take that burden from you, he'll lift it off of you, and he'll give you joy and, and, and happiness beyond anything you've yet known. Jesus Christ will lift that burden off you. He says, come unto me, all ye that are burdened and heavy laden. And he'll lift it off of you. He'll set you free from the burden of sin and the sorrow and the suffering and the unhappiness of your life and give you a joy that's past understanding, a joy where you, all the heartaches and troubles of this life, even though they're still at times way heavy, but yet they still won't bring you down as long as you look to the Lord and find your strength in Him. It's not just that first time when you're first saved and you come forth and acknowledge before a congregation and you're part, made, you're baptized and become a part of that local visible assembly. But it's during the rest of your life that you're willing then to tell others. My friends, if you're one who is saved and, oh, you're just so backwards and bashful, oh, I just can't hardly tell anybody about what I believe. I can't tell people about Jesus. I, I just can't find the ability to do that. My friends, if you don't have that ability, you cannot say, I believe in Jesus Christ. You, you need to understand. I want you to understand these things. If you, if you don't have a desire in your heart to set Jesus before others, be a witness, tell Jesus, tell us about Jesus, friend, there's something wrong with you. If you're not able, if you're not willing to confess before others that you're a Christian and that you believe the gospel and that you would to God that they too might believe the gospel and repent and turn to God, there's something wrong with you, my friend. I want you to understand this, that if that's the condition you're living in, you, you think you were saved back there some more. Uh, maybe you were a young kid, and you, uh, you after that long benediction, just on and on, you finally, you felt let go up, and oh, I'm going to go up, and I'll, I'll, I'll do this, just so maybe we can go home, or whatever reason you did it. Maybe your friends went up, and you went with them, and you know in your heart you're still not quite right with God. There's just something not quite right there. You're still burdened down. You still don't have a liberty within you to where you can speak up and say, Friend, I want to tell you about Jesus. I want to tell you what the Lord's done for me even today and this week. How that he's provided for me. How that he's watched over me as I traveled to work and back. and How that he's blessed me and my family. Oh, that you might know him. Oh, that you might look to him and believe upon him even as I have. If you can't do that, if you don't have the liberty to confess him before men and tell others about him during your walk of life, this is what he says. But whosoever shall not whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. So but I don't deny him. But you're just you're not confessing him either. You're either confessing the Lord and acknowledging him in your walk of life and the way you live, first of all, and then also in what you say. And if your walk of life doesn't show forth Jesus Christ, and what you say doesn't show forth Jesus Christ, then you're denying him before men. You're denying him in the way you live. You're denying him in the way you speak. And he says he'll deny you before his Father when he stands before him. And uh, you oneness people. What did he just say here? It says, whosoever, there in verse 32, whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father, which is in heaven. And in verse 33, but whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father. 
you oneness people need to understand something. If they are one person at the same time, if the Son, the Father, the Holy Spirit are all just one person, then Jesus just lied. He deceives. This is not this is dishonest. And it's not possible. You make him to be a liar. You make him to be a deceiver by your doctrine, you oneness people. And you, uh, well, you oneness people do. You Unitarians got a whole other problem. You deny Christ outright. But you oneness people try to acknowledge them all as one person. Oh, there's one God? There's one God. Yes, there is one living God. One thrice holy God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Three persons in the Godhead. And yes, brethren, it is a hard thing to comprehend. But Jesus says that he will be, he will stand before his Father and he will confess us. As our great high priest, he stands there before God the Father and he acknowledges that he's paid our sin debt, he saved us, and that we're going to heaven. And others he will deny ever knowing because they repented not from their ungodly ways. If they are not two distinct persons, then the writing here is dishonest, and he is lying, and you make him to be a liar by your doctrine, you oneness people. He is. Two. This is two people. Here is Jesus the Christ, and his Father that is in heaven, and whom he declares he will stand before him and acknowledges, he'll confess this, as his brethren, his kinsmen. He is our kinsman redeemer after all. And in him we have salvation and not in any other. No, not in the name of Yahweh, which is not even in the Hebrew text anywhere. You Yahweh people better wake up too. You're being deceived. You've been led away from the one true name whereby we must be saved. Jesus the Christ. Jesus will stand, and he does stand there before the Father, there at the right hand of the throne of God, where he intercedes for us, our great high priest. And there's no man in this world who can intercede for us. Your dad can't. The pastor of your church can't do it. That uh, godly man or godly woman in the church with you can't do it. Only Jesus Christ can intercede for you. The priest to the believer allows us, each of us, every one of us, to come boldly before the throne of God's grace and cry out unto him, Abba, Father. He will hear us. Let us move on. In the book of Romans, chapter 10, starting in verse 5, here it says, For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend unto heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is, to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth, in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ thou shalt believe in thy, and thou shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead thou shalt be saved if we're not willing to confess Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior before men he will not confess us before the Father we're still lost and undone. Oh, we're a religious people, but he doesn't know you. If you don't have this liberty within you, not to go before some man in a box somewhere, it's, oh, I've done this and this and this this week and since I was here last. No, but to confess before men that you're a Christian, that you believe the gospel, and that you're confessing him in the way you live and what you say. You ought to be a an example. We are to be we are to be examples before all those round about us. We're to be holy, even as He is holy. Don't make excuses for your sin. Don't make excuses. Well, you know, uh, 
I, I'm under the grace of God. I can go out here and just live however I want to. That's the wrong way of thinking. I'm saved by the grace of God. I don't want to live however I might want to. I don't want to live how this old flesh would lead me. And the desires of the heart, oh, wretched man that I am, there's nothing good within me except the Holy Spirit of God which indwells me and leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. It lifts up before me Jesus Christ and shows me my Lord and Savior who suffered and died on the cross to redeem me from all my sins. And he did. Right there on that cross of Calvary, he redeemed me from all my sins. Even every time before I was saved that I heard it and didn't believe it. My friends... If you really look at what the Word of God says about the judgment of God, He is going to judge the lost sinners for all their deeds, not just their unbelief. There are degrees of punishment in hell, and some are suffering greater punishment than others because some are more guilty than others. And we ought to understand these things. These things which God here sets before us. On, going on here to verse 10, he says, For with the heart mouth, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Those who cannot acknowledge God, cannot speak with the mouth and say, I believe the gospel. Now, I'm talking about people that can talk now. Not the one who is mute, who can't speak. God knoweth your condition. So I, I can hear, but I can't speak. I, I don't have a voice. My, Whatever reason, maybe it's a, from a birth defect or something happened to you, cancer's ate up your throat, and you can't speak anymore. But God heareth the cry of your heart, my friend. Don't you understand that? He heareth the cry of your heart, and there are other ways to speak to people other than verbally pronouncing it. The way you live speaks to them. The things you might write down, and you can I see people with cards at times who are not they're what they call their death or they can't speak because of death. And God heareth the heart. He knoweth your heart better than you do yourself. And you don't have to be able to speak with a voice for God to hear you. Well, you know, some people want to put such limitations on God's all. Oh, uh, if God can't hear you speak out loud, how can he hear you repent? He hears you. God is a merciful God, and he heareth those that cry out unto him. He knoweth your disability. He knoweth your weaknesses better than you do yourself. But to you that can speak properly, clearly, who uh, still have the hardness of your heart, the old stubborn man that you are, or woman, and you refuse to humble yourself before the thrice holy God and acknowledge Him in all His ways, and you need to understand this, that if you will not humble yourself before God and acknowledge Him and repent and turn from your ungodly ways, you will stand before Him guilty of all those sins and be judged for all your sins, not just for unbelief. He says the Scripture saith. Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. And how true that is. This is a scripture we're reading to you, my friends. The King James Bible right here. This is scripture. This is scripture. Not just that old original first, first version delivered by the inspiration of God to the hand of the prophet who wrote it down or the hand of whoever was that wrote it down. That's not the only scripture there is. But every copy of it was scripture also. A copy of scripture is scripture and copy of a copy of copy of scripture scripture. They, there in the days of Christ, they had the scriptures, the Old Testament that were delivered unto them even going back 1,500 years before that, but yet they still had the scriptures because they had been copied and they had been preserved by the 
working in the power of God, just as they have been preserved and brought down to us in this day and time. The Hebrew scriptures are still in the world. The Greek scriptures are still in the world. And yes, there are those that are corrupted and they're false. The majority are right. The majority, the greater witness is right always in the word of God. And it's been translated into the English. That you English speaking, you English understanding people might be pricked in your hearts and moved in repentance and faith toward God. No, you can't hear and understand Hebrew. You can't hear and understand Greek. Nor Latin or none of these, any, any of these other old languages of the ancient days. But by the grace of God you can hear and understand this English language and you know what it says. And it is God that brought it into your hearing. All of a sudden one wants to say, oh, you're worshiping a man. You're right, I'm worshiping, worshiping the man Christ Jesus. The God-man. The Son, the only begotten Son of God, who suffered and died on the cross of Calvary for my sins. And I am to confess and declare unto others that He is my Lord, He is my Savior, and I'm not ashamed of Him. Says there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Repent, ye ungodly sinner, and turn from your ways. It's not just a matter of changing your mind. You've got to acknowledge that God is right, that you're a sinner, condemned and unclean, and uh, you uh, love gospel people that have run away from that. So, oh, we don't want to acknowledge sin. We don't want to beat people over the head. We don't want to make them feel bad. Well, God have mercy upon you because you're not acknowledging God in all His ways. You have cut the gospel short. You have dropped off the first half of it where God reproves and convicts us of our sinful ways. Oh, look at old Saul there. And all that he did, did not God prick his heart because of those he had brought unto death, those whom he had tortured, those whom he had persecuted? You better believe he did. God showed him that he as a religious man was not okay in his religion. He was still on his way to hell. And so are many of you who refuse to acknowledge God in all his ways and humble yourselves for this thrice holy God which we declare to you from the word of God. Not man, not men, but God himself is the one who judges you and his only begotten Son is the only one who can save you from all your sins. And you're to confess him as your Lord and your Savior, to believe upon him. And only those that believe upon him can confess him as Lord. And if you refuse to acknowledge him as Lord, as your sovereign over you, then your heart's not right with God either. Does that mean you're lost? No, not necessarily. It just means you're not right with God and you refuse to acknowledge Him in all His ways. You've got this high-minded attitude. Well, I, I, I gave my gift of faith to God and He owes me salvation now. You self-righteous hypocrite. You don't deserve anything. None of us do. But God gave unto us salvation. We who deserved hell, we deserve the wrath of God. And we better confess him before men. If we call upon him, he will save us. And he'll give us the liberty to confess him before men. We won't be ashamed of this great salvation which we have in Jesus Christ. Friends, we're out of time again. May God bless you and keep you until we meet again.